So welcome everyone to our Sunday, uh, September Sunday conversation presented by the Massachusetts ME, CFS, and FM Association, otherwise known as Mass ME. We're really excited to see all of you and thank you for coming today. Um, I'd like to extend a special welcome to our Mass ME members. Your membership makes it possible for the organization to host and sustain these Sunday conversations, our support groups, patient services, and more. So if you'd like to learn more about how membership helps the organization or to become a member, uh, please visit our website at massmecfs.org slash join. Uh, today, we're honored to have Dr. Jill Krista with us. She's a pioneering naturopathic doctor, a best-selling author, devoted educator, and creative innovator. Her superpower is to make complex medical topics excuse me, complex medical concepts, simple and digestible for the average person. Uh, her passion is to really elevate the well-being of the planet via the well-being of her inhabitants. Her books and online courses support those wanting concrete steps to conquer health challenges for conditions that cause injury to the brain and the nervous system, including mold, pans and pandas, Lyme's disease, and concussions. Um, she's now turned her efforts to supporting children and teens struggling with pandas and pans, and as a mother of children affected by pans, she's combined the knowledge gained through her clinical and personal experience into an indispensable book titled A Light in the Dark for Pandas and Pans, and a training for doctors on the topic approved for AMA Category 1 CME credit. Um, so we now have most of the hour to discuss with Dr. Jill, so welcome. Um, we're going to explore those three general topics, like we had said. These include mold in our living situations, mold, um, or excuse me, symptoms of mold toxicity and its relation to MECFS, uh, as well as diagnostics and treatment. After these sections, we do hope to have time for um, specific comments about Maracons, pans, and pandas. Um, but for now, we're going to tackle each of these three uh, with some of your survey uh, comments that were submitted beforehand. Um, so to start with the first topic, uh, Dr. Jill, we had someone, Elise, write in that um, she has mold in her new house that is very stressful and expensive to mediate. Um, I'm considering moving into a rental home where I could more easily avoid this work and move again if necessary. Ideally, I'd like to buy a home that has less mold and less harmful mold, but I don't know if a seller would agree to a mold assessment. So her question is um, that she'd really value hearing how people go about finding a safe space to live in. Yeah, this is a common problem. And first of all, thank you so much for having me here. This is a huge honor to be supporting this group. Um, the, the great forgotten <laughs> chronic illness sufferers, um, you, are, you guys hold a special place in my heart. So um, thank you. Yeah, this um, finding a safe place to live becomes kind of a scary, it can, it, there can be a lot of fear wrapped around it. And I'm just going to preface all this with the fact that I'm a building, I'm not a building expert, I'm a body expert. Um, I know enough about the building stuff to be dangerous, but I've learned a lot in my years. So I'll be kind of talking from that perspective of me from the clinical space. Um, I also want to make sure and mention that anything that I'm talking about here is meant just as health education and support for you. It's not meant as personal medical advice, um, and it does not initiate a doctor-patient relationship with us. After I give uh, talks like this, a lot of times I get requests to take on um, people as a new patient, and I am not accepting new patients. I, I haven't for years, um, unfortunately. So my I'm here to fulfill my mission to bring more education. And I'm also working really hard to train more doctors. So you guys have more providers that can help you out on the day to day. Um, all right. So safe living space. I, I was just talking with the crew before we went on the entire indoor environmental professional profession has been very, very slow to adopt mycotoxins as part of the story. Um, and even slower to adopt bacteria and endotoxins. So this is something that the inspector that I work with, we've been working together for almost 20 years on these things and testing for mycotoxins, testing for endotoxins. Uh, mycotoxins for me create probably 75 to 80% of the symptoms for people who are exposed to mold and the spores, which is what the entire indoor environmental professional profession is focusing on, accounts for maybe 10 to 15% of the symptoms. Spores are going to cause more like the allergies, the mast cells, asthma, sinusitis, post-nasal drip, 
um, those sorts of things that we would associate as normal mold sensitivity slash mold allergy. But then there's this other huge chunk of symptoms that are related to mycotoxin exposure. And mycotoxins can, can be in the indoor environment without any odor. They don't have an odor. So that moldy, musty smell is metabolizing mold chemicals, so mold aft-gassing. Mycotoxins are nanoparticle size and they can move through building material. So if the spores are trapped be, be under a flooring or behind a shower insert or something like that, those mycotoxins can be coming into the indoor environment. Every time someone opens a door, the front door, it creates a vacuum and it kind of sucks that air from that, that trapped building area and the nanoparticles can move in. So what I'm focusing on with the fact that 70 to 80% of my patient base is getting sick from the mycotoxins and the number one symptom of mycotoxin exposure is fatigue. That's like huge crossover with what you guys are struggling with, right? So if we're going to be thinking about finding you a safe place, we need to know not only about the spore count in that environment, but the mycotoxin load, because it's the mycotoxins that are causing the fatigue. They also lead to the way they're causing fatigue is mitochondrial damage, and they're also leading to more pain syndromes. So we get into this complete, you know, crossover of symptoms with MECFS from the toxins. So the way that I'm working with my patients that I'm still working with, I still see all my legacy patients, we make sure that we do a dust test for mycotoxins. And your doctor can work on this with you, but I would highly recommend working with an indoor inspector so that you know that you're testing the right thing. But with my patients and myself, before I buy a new home or anything like that, I take a dust test and send it into a lab called Hayes Microbial Lab. That's H-A-Y-E-S Microbial. They're in New Jersey. And they do, you have to be a professional in order to order that test because there's a lot of fraud in the industry of people trying to get their, you know, kitchen remodel it and <laughs> say, we have a mold problem. We need to remodel our kitchen. We're just tired of it. Um, so they're working against that, that aspect too, which I know like blows all of our minds. Um, but it happens. So you have to have somebody who has a license either as an indoor environmental professional or as a physician to order that test. But once it's once you do the test that the your practitioner can order it for you, you can pre-test that space. So every every seller should be fine with a pre-test of mold. And if they're not, they're probably hiding something. So every single situation of a, a sale and exchange, and in some states it's required legally to have an assessment. But even in the states where it's required, those are not mold experts. Those are building inspectors, but they are not mold inspectors. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're using a second inspector. In a lot of cases with my families, what we're doing, and it's hard in this market right now because things are, you know, there's so much demand for houses. There's not a lot of supply and, you, you know, houses are going like that. But in a perfect world, what we would do is do a pre-dust test in the indoor environment when you're there looking at the house. Like if you like bring the sterile cloth along, bring the swab along. Hayes Microbial uses a swab. Um, and if you like it and you're even thinking maybe this is the place for us, test while you're there and run the test. It's $300, so $299. And it has a very extensive mycotoxin profile. So if the mycotoxins are high, that is not a good space for you. It doesn't matter if it's a current mold problem or a past mold problem that they cleaned up. They're only doing the cleaning to clean the spores and the spore fragments. So the indoor environmental professional that is doing the post-testing of any remediation is only looking at the spores I only know of one guy in the Pacific Northwest that's doing remediation recommendations that's addressing the mycotoxins. These write around on small particles. So if there's a high load of mycotoxins in that space, that is not going to be a healthy space for you. So pre-testing with a dust mycotoxin test, and I talk about that in my book, Break the Mold, of how you would do it. You just, you know, you test ahead of time. And if it's positive, that's a sick home. And you can get in the idea of like, You'll hear from a lot of environmental professionals that, you know, well, there aren't any safe homes. Everywhere is moldy. False. <laughs> 
There are absolutely safe places for you to be. You can be held safely in this world. You deserve it. You deserve, you are worth finding a place that heals you and not a place you have to heal. And if anybody needs support with that, I have a free guided visualization on my website. Um, it's called the Clarity Pep Talk. I jokingly call it the breakup with mold visualization um, because what can happen is you can get into a coherence with it, an energetic coherence with mold. So you're on the same vibrational frequency and then everywhere you go next will be moldy. You, insurance sends you to a hotel while they remediate. That hotel will be moldy. The remediation fails. Something, you know, you buy, you sell one house and you buy the next house to try to escape mold and it's moldy. So please, 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 please take advantage of this free resource. It's 11 minutes long. You can listen to it with both ears because it's a, it's a sound healing and it will help to bump you off that coherence with mold and, and get you well. And I even did it myself. Um, I recently had a water problem in my basement, which I am anti finished basement. So my basement isn't finished. So it was not that big a deal. And it was just one of these things that I'm like, I probably should take care of that. I probably should take care of that. I probably should take care of that. I said that for three months and I'm the mold lady. And I found myself tell telling a friend on the phone, I was like, oh my gosh, it's been three months. I probably should take care of that. And I started laughing. I was like, it sounds like I need to listen to my visualization. Hung up the phone, listened to my visualization. That morning, the next morning, I called the, the guys to come fix the foundation crack. And they had the gutter problem and the foundation crack done within the week. So this is big medicine. Sound healing is big medicine and it's available to you for free. Okay. So that was kind of a long one. We covered a lot of little answers that I'll circle back to when we, with the rest of them. I was just going to say, thank you, Dr. Jill. So many of the questions people have or part of their stories are yeah. so interwoven and connecting so many things. It was hard to organize um, the questions separately sometimes based on these things, but I'm taking notes so we yeah. don't duplicate anything, but you're touching on so much stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah. In a kind of similar vein, um, I know you said in some states or some places, these differences between um, uh, inspectors versus medicine. Um, one person did ask, um, I'm sure this is dependent on the location, but if landlords are obligated to do that testing or remediate for mold that's found. Um, they are not obligated necessarily to do the testing, um, depending on your state. If they are obligated on your state, they will only test for spores. So it will miss the mycotoxins completely. There is no mold legislation in the entire U.S. and to my knowledge, globally, that is addressing mycotoxins, unfortunately. Oh, by the way, I wanna say on the finding a safe place to live, every seller should allow a mold assessment, and but you do need to disclose what you're going to be doing. And what you wanna make sure is that you're working with your realtor to be able to completely walk away without losing your earnest money if there is a mold problem found. And that includes mycotoxin testing. Do not allow a quote, right to cure, because what they will do is paint over the problem and say, taken care of. And that is not good remediation. So yeah, make sure you build into your paperwork, get a good realtor who will stick up for you and just say, I need the ability to walk away. If this is found to be high in any kind of mold spore, you could run an ERMI. The ERMI scores are really, really um, problematic. <laughs> the algorithm that is used, that the ERMI was never meant to diagnose. That was meant as a survey, a US survey. So um, I like something called the dust test, the dust test.com. All these resources are on my website on the footer. Um, so you don't have to be thinking really clearly. You can just click. <laughs> um, what I like about them is that they do the same test as an ERMI, but then they give you their interpretation after 4,000. They've compiled 4,000 different homes and testing that they've done. And the, you can actually call a real life human and get a 15 minute, what the heck does this mean? And what do I need to do next? Um, consult for free as part of the test. So that's why I like that one. Did I get, did I finish my thought? I don't know. I'm not sure I did, but. <laughs> I think you at least covered most of that one for the question. Okay, good. <laughs> um, so I think for this section, uh, we have time for, for one more on, again, another similar vein. Um, Lottie had written that uh, my doctor believes that my ME-CFS may be caused by or exacerbated by mold, partly because I tested positive for high levels of mycotoxins in my blood. Uh, my husband and I paid for an extensive mold inspection of our house, and the inspector found several mold colonies with active black mold. 
Um, we're now getting quotes for mold remediation and house reconstruction, like you're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. so she had asked, how can we make the case for applying for coverage for mold remediation and related medical expenses to their homeowner's insurance company? To my knowledge, there's been no homeowner's insurance that will cover medical expenses. Um, not unless you bring a, a legal case, and then that is being awarded a, a legal finding, not part of your homeowners. We are there is a paucity of research right now for um, molds effects on humans. It's really blown off as like a allergy problem or a sensitivity problem, um, which is very very unfortunate. Because like I said in the beginning, that's only ten to fifteen percent of the story. So this other huge part of the story is mycotoxins, which are carcinogenic. They cause cancer. They cause birth defects. They, you know, like this is no small deal to be exposed to these. Um, there is a, on Instagram, it's just well law. There is a law firm. So if, if that is something where it was building error or something like that, that you can tie to the builder, um, that might be something to even investigate a legal case, but how to get your home insurance company the way that I recommend people do is lawyer up, whether you think you're going to need to or not, call your lawyer and just have your lawyer contact your homeowner's insurance and say, show us. And, and this is actually how I got a lot covered in my own house when we had mold. Show me the specific language about mold remediation. And typically what they'll do is they'll have two buckets. There's going to be the destruction, tear things out bucket, and then the rebuild bucket. And there's usually two dollar amounts or limits that they will do for that. A lot of times they will try to not cover things if it's a, there, there are certain things that they know are pretty consistently found in homes. And that is like, um, if, you, if you're on a slab and the slab is weeping and you put carpet on that, no one should be putting carpet on concrete. Um, and they just say, well, you know, you should have known better, you're bad, so we're not gonna cover that. But if you can find an event, a spill, a leak, a, something like that, that typically is covered. But I have my patients just call their lawyer and say, would you work with me to, to make sure that this is covered? And if there's a lawyer involved, they tend to, to make good on your policy. But every policy is so different. So it just, it's hard to know. Yeah. But boy, you sure get their attention when you're like, oh, my attorney wants wants you to send them. Here's their email address. Show us the specific language in the policy related to mold. And that really helps. Okay. Um, in moving towards our second topic, um, symptoms of mold toxicity and more relationship to MECFS. Um, I want to start off with this really great question to kind of set the stage. Um, this person had asked, are there any specific symptoms of mold toxicity, things that we should look for in our own bodies that if we are suspecting mold to be a cause, would these be respiratory, skin, GI? Like what, what should people be looking for if they suspect this? Yes. All the above. <laughs> <laughs> that's the problem. And that's why mold gets missed all the time. Um, it is more the, the rule than the exception that every person with the same exposure will have different set of symptoms. And the symptoms are, um, it's the making your Achilles heel worse. So you already have a tendency toward fill in the blank, fatigue, neuropathy, um, GI problems, urinary sensitivity and frequency, brain fog, um, word finding difficulty. So whatever that like thing is already, or, oh, we, we have that cancer in my family or, oh, psoriasis runs in our family. Well, guess what? Psoriasis is very highly correlated to mold exposure. Oh, scleroderma runs in our family. Same. Asthma, same. Highly correlated to mold exposure. So how do we find it when everybody's body is going to show us a different pattern? Um, and that's that vexed me in practice a long time. And so what I did is I created a, a diagnostic questionnaire and I know Dr. Shoemaker has one too, but I'm mine, I am feel like I'm getting more of the mycotoxin story in there. And so if you're feeling like, whoa, I, I think mycotoxins might actually be part of my story, um, this questionnaire may help you better get a, a mold risk score because we're also looking at things like um, the mold chemicals, so microbial VOCs, mold emits something called mycophenolic acid, which is highly immunotoxic and really hard on the gut. Um, it, and also bacteria and bacteria endotoxins. All of that is accounted for in that questionnaire. So when you're saying, what are the specific symptoms? There's no specifics, but there's a cluster that starts to point more arrows. 
And I'm just going to run through that cluster, but I really encourage you to get the questionnaire. It's free on my website and you can get your mold risk score. But also what's fun about this is then as you're going through treatment, if you're like, oh, it is mold, let's go see somebody and get better. You can then fill that out all through time and keep track of your symptoms. And that should be a really good guide of like, are we going the right direction or are we going the wrong direction with your treatment? I use that in practice all the time. It's the questionnaire I currently use. And um, it's the questionnaire that is part of a, a research study. We just got an IRB approved research study to try to get more um, research done on mycotoxins in humans. That's the problem. Because we know these guys can cause cancer and cause birth defects, there is no way that we would get funding for a study that says, hey, who wants to be poisoned by these things? And when we're going to give you milk thistle and see if that helps, you know, no, we can't do it. Medical ethics says no. So we're missing all of that human research. And without the human research, now the indoor environmental profession says, well, that's not a thing. Well, it's not that it's the, the absence of evidence is not the same as evidence of absence, as they say. So just because we're missing the evidence doesn't mean that it's not true. So what are, what's the cluster? Fatigue. Like I said, number one, number one, the, the largest majority of people that have been exposed to mold and mycotoxins have fatigue. Um, that can look like fatigue of the high energy systems of the body, which would be brain. So your brain wears out fast. Vision, your eyes wear out. You get changing vision, double vision, tired eyes, difficulty reading, those kinds of things. The heart, the heart is a hog for energy. So you can get things like heart palpitations. You can get heart pain, chest pain, um, heart rate changes that your body has a little bit of an autonomic um, hiccup in there that your heart, that's where you'll get those palpitations or fluttering. So those three sy systems may be the first to show up with the fatigue, but it could just be like muscle fatigue, movement fatigue. Um, you know, you try to work out because somebody said that will help with your fatigue because it'll oxygenate your body and then you're in bed for three days. That fatigue. The fatigue that mycotoxins cause is mitochondrial damage. So it can look like the whole mitochondria are in every cell in our body except our red blood cells. So every single area can show that up. So fatigue on, in a competitive athlete might just mean that they aren't as competitive, but it's there in every picture. Anxiety or anxiousness is there. Visual changes, what I was just talking about with the eyes using up a lot of energy. Ear ringing is highly specific to mold exposure, specifically mycotoxins, because we breathe them in through our sinuses and there's this, it will accumulate in that area of our sinuses where the inner ear goes near. Um, then we see a lot of gut disruption. You can see breathing issues, shortness of breath, sensitive lungs, asthma, that kind of thing. Sinusitis can happen. Doesn't always happen if you don't have a lot of spore exposure. Um, then you may not have as much sinusitis. Uh, and then urinary frequency and rashes. So those are kind of, that's kind of the cluster of things that we're just like, wow, when we see a really mold sick person, we're almost always seeing those patterns plus some other stuff that's unique to their physiology. Um, hormones, depending on the mold, some mycotoxins are hormone disruptors. So you might also see some hormone disruption, including thyroid, estrogen, and testosterone. So it's, it's really, you know, that's why I came up with the questionnaire because I'm a very impatient practitioner <laughs> and I wanted to know, how do I get to the answer faster? And so that's, that's when I use the questionnaire and I use it all the time in my practice. Um, we have quite a few questions um, on similar to what you're saying about fatigue being this kind of flag mark, uh, flagship uh, symptom, mm -hmm. um, really asking, can mold exposure really be a trigger for MECFS symptoms? Can it be more of a chicken before the egg thing where mold is causing the MECFS? Um, and in terms of timeline, how critical is an exposure to mold? Essentially, these living situations like you're talking about really long term versus uh, maybe visiting a residence with more acute um, a mold problem, let's say. I love this question because there's this perception that um, you can't get sick from just staying at an Airbnb. You can't get MECFS from just that. Yes, you can. And uh, I see it. <laughs> That's why I can say that so confidently. And now we have better testing. So now I can track some of these things. Um, 
Can it be mold all by itself that triggered ME-CFS? Yes. And what Dr. Joseph Brewer found in his study in 2013, he, uh, so I like to use antifungals because I find that the the body, and I'm usually using herbs if if we can. I'll use pharmaceuticals if needed, but usually herbs do the trick. Um, what I find is that as you're being exposed to these toxins and these spores, the spores will induce so much mast cell response. So that will wear out the immune system, and the mycotoxins are immunotoxic, meaning they're they will cause immune depletion of your, of your mucosal surfaces, of your sinuses, your lungs, your gut, your bladder, your skin. So what happens then is over time, the more of that you are exposed to, the more toxins actually accumulate in those tissues. And then we can see that the normal fungi that are in everybody's noses, we all have fungal spores in our noses. So if we were to test healthy people and sick people with MECFS, and this is the cohort that Dr. Brewer did. He did it with MECFS patients, tested everybody. And lo and behold, we all have, we all have fungus spores in our nose, big deal. But the difference is the people that were healthy controls had no mycotoxins in those washings. And the people who are sick with MECFS had mycotoxins in their sinuses, in their lungs, in their brain, they did brain biopsy and gut, they did gut biopsy. So that was when I was like, hello, this is a colonization issue. This means that you become the moldy building. You actually become the host. And Dr. Dennis, who's a EENT in Atlanta, when he takes out these little fungal balls that can grow in sinuses and you put them on a sterile pad, they will continue to make mycotoxins even out of the body for hours and hours and hours afterwards. So that's why I like to use intranasal and also whole body antifungals because there has been a fundamental shift of our microbiome that we can really move someone a lot faster into their healing if we can knock back that pathogenic biofilm that's happening in the body and get it back to a commensal microbiome. It's kind of like giving probiotics. I use probiotics in the nose quite a bit. Um, so can it just be from the mold exposure that sets it off? Absolutely yes. And in Dr. Joseph Brewer's study, it was 93% of people had mycotoxins in their washings that had MACFS with a water damage building exposure. And that was compared to controls. It's nice to have those studies. <laughs> when, I, when I read that, I was like, at that time, I was only using systemic or whole body and antifungals. And I read that study and I was like, oh, it's colonization of the sinuses. And this Every time you swallow snot, every time you swallow something goes down, that will seed your entire gut. So when I added the intranasal antifungals, which some of my favorite things are propolis, essential oils, ozone, there's all kinds of things you can use to knock back that fungal colonization. My patients went from getting better like this to just all of a sudden better, better. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've been missing this. I started calling patients like I've been missing something. <laughs> I need to add the, the intranasals. Yeah. So I hope that's helpful for people. I was going to say, that's awesome to hear. And we do have some other, um, I think later in the, in the next uh, section of the program for treatment specific questions, but this is mm -hmm. definitely a good start. Like I said, these all weave in and yeah. out together. So it's hard to yes. separate. So I don't want to miss uh, related <laughs> questions. Um, yeah. It, so somebody says, you know, if I move to a mold free home, then what, you know, well, if you right. became the moldy building, you still need to treat the body um, to in order to fully conquer it. And I see people with MECFS get completely better, a hundred percent get their life back with treatment. So it is absolutely possible. That's great to hear a real world. Example. Very hopeful. You're able to see yeah. 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 I mean, I see, I see their, their, I do sinus testing. I know we were going to talk about Marcon's later. Marcon's mm -hmm. is a thing to me. It's a biofilm indicator. I also see um, MRSA, you know, we and I test with a company called Microgen DX. Um, we see those completely normalized. We see mycotoxin tests come to zero. And we, the most important thing, we see people get their life back and not be so reactive. So how does somebody go to an Airbnb and get sick from just that, you know, two or three day exposure? It's because they did become a moldy building previously, and now it's colonized. And now they get into that mycotoxin smelly environment, which has no smell, they don't know it, 
And now it triggers all those colonies to act defensively and reactivate. And that's how you can get whacked in just a little bit. So when you treat the colonization, you're a lot less sensitive and reactive to environments. I see. Mm -hmm. um, in kind of a similar thread, we have from a few different angles, some similar questions relating to what if I can't leave my environment where the mold may be present um, or in terms of the timeline, how long do you have to basically avoid repeat exposure if you're already dealing with or if you already have a mold problem like yourself? Mm -hmm. you, no one should be in mold. <laughs> okay. And especially people who have been made sick. So if you're symptomatic in any way, if you're not robust health, then you should not be in mold, period. There, mold is natural, yes, but when it comes inside, it starts to act unnaturally. It doesn't have sun, you know, no UV rays. Um, it has stagnant air. There's not, you know, insects drinking up all the extra little moisture and dew in the morning. You know, all of these forces, and it's also not in touch with the mycelial network of the forest. That mycelial network is a super wisdom um, it is like a, the balancing force of our planet. So when mold spores come into an indoor environment, it sees a bunch of previously living organic material. And if you're watering it by not managing your humidity, I would say that's the number one thing that you have control over is manage the indoor humidity with a dehumidifier and keep it under 55% and dust like crazy. I could say a dust with gusto. Those are two things that can knock down this, this load in your indoor environment and um, are also part of prevention once you get your remediation done. Um, and so there are plenty of animal studies that show us that there are things that you can do. It took me an hour to go over all of them. <laughs> I have a course called Nine Things to Know If You're Still in Mold. Um, I even am careful about my words because I'm not saying you're stuck in mold. No one is stuck. You are still in mold. You're working out your plan. Um, so there are nine things that you can do and uh, that has been taken from animal research, such as DHA, the fish oil DHA, has been shown in animal studies to protect the cells from mycotoxin invasion. Quercetin, milk thistle, and milk thistle has in the studies on animals, so this is translational research taken from animals to humans, has a minimum effective dose of 750 milligrams a day. I usually do that in divided doses with my patients. Most milk thistle capsules are about 450 to 500 milligrams. So we'll do one capsule in the morning, one at night. Those are things that we know. Selenium, vitamin E in the tocotrienol form. That's taken from animal studies that they know they're going to be exposing them to not just moldy feed, but moldy barns. So inhalational exposure. I was really careful to try to find as much that would mimic the indoor environment where you'd be breathing it, not eating it. And um, in those studies, again, DHA, um, quercetin, milk thistle, selenium, vitamin E, these are all things that they give to the animals in their feed then because it's cheaper to do that than to remediate their building. So they think mm -hmm. it'd be cheaper to remediate the building, but that's what they're adding to feed. And they're also commonly adding um, rosemary to the feed. And while these are animal studies, so we don't have adequate doses or, you know, we're, it's not human studies. So I can't be telling you what the dose is from a, from a human study, the way that I'm doing the translational research from multiple different species of animals. So rats, boiler chickens, all the different things, turkeys, you know, that they are giving DHA, um, pigs are probably the closest to humans. So I found that to be the most helpful study. It's high doses of DHA. It's in the 3000 milligrams of DHA that are protective if you're actively in mold. And that's what I'm using with my patients. Okay. Yeah. Um, in moving on to our third topic, uh, diagnostics and treatments for mold, um, I wanna start off with a question, really, what are the first kinds of tests you should be doing to figure out if you have mycotoxins in, let's say, like your blood or in your body? Yeah, the, that's as individual as the as how to test a building. <laughs> okay. Um, so there's really what we're looking at is a cluster of different things because we're trying, if you look at how the different ways mold can make you sick, it's the spores, spore fragments, those are going to be more allergy problems. The chemicals that mold emits, something called mycophenolic acid, this is um, made into a drug 
that we use in medicine to prevent organ rejection when someone's had an organ transplant. So that's how immunosuppressive it is. <laughs> Bad news. Um, mycotoxins, which are different, mycotoxins are made on purpose to compete for territory. So this is where mold has found like a nice moist place in your house and some dust and maybe some cardboard on a cardboard floor or a concrete floor, one of its favorite things. Um, and so you you might be getting the, the picture that you don't have to have a flood. You don't have to have a leak. This can happen from high humidity and not setting your space up correctly. Um, so if mold has found that sweet spot, it thinks of it like lake front property, it will then make mycotoxins to compete with all the other things in the environment. So if you have one mycotoxin in your body, you know that there were more molds and there's more mycotoxins. It's just that your body can't necessarily tell you that. So, so we've got the mycotoxins, we have bacteria and bacterial endotoxins. Those are all the ways that a damp building can make you sick. So really what we're trying to do is find the cluster of labs because not every lab is right for every person. If you are on glutathione, there is a urine test you should not take because it will look more normal than it really is. And that is the mass spec method, which is by um, Vibrant Labs and Mosaic or Great Plains. Um, so there are these things that I've learned in my um, doctor training course, the what test to choose for which patient takes 45 minutes. But I'll tell you the question that most is on most people's mind is, am I being exposed to mold right now? That's the most important one to answer because 50% of people get better if they get out of the mold with no treatment, no nothing. They just get out or they remediate or, you know, whatever getting away from the exposure looks like. So 50% of people don't, and that's why we need some people doing treatment. So if avoidance is the most important thing and knowing whether you're actively being exposed or not is the most important question to answer, there are four things that I will run to, to look at the various ways that mold makes you sick. So a mold allergy test, no one should be allergic to mold. Mold is natural, it's part of our environment. If you're allergic to mold, you're either in mold or you're colonized with mold. There is no such thing, or unless you have a, a profession where you're being exposed to spores all the time. So if you're a, a mycologist or something like that, and you're like in a lab making spores, now in theory, you'd have a mask on, so that wouldn't happen. So a mold allergy test, no one should be allergic to mold. Mold is part of our environment. A VCS test, I like one called vcstest.com. I like it because they calibrate the screen before you take it. So if you're taking a visual test, you should probably calibrate the instrument first. And I really like their, their results are easier to, for people to understand. That's a visual contrast sensitivity test. And it's used by the military and Dr. Shoemaker popularized this. It's used by the military looking for biotoxins. So that will look at a partial answer to the mycotoxin and possibly endotoxin exposure. That can also be bad from a Lyme, Lyme test or from a Herx. So none of these are specific to one to just mold, and that's why we do a cluster. Then a urine mycophenolic acid, or MPA. MPA is not a mycotoxin, even though they, the labs listed it that, which drives me crazy. It's important that you know it's not a mycotoxin because MPA is only made when mold is actively metabolizing. It is a mold fart. It's an off gas. So if it's there in your body, in your urine, and you're excreting it, you're breathing it and that you're breathing it from a moldy building. And so if that MPA is high, that's more arrows pointing toward, yes, you're in mold. And the final one is a, is a blood mycotoxin antibody test. So it's similar to the mold allergy test. A mold allergy test is only looking at spores. It's not looking at the mycotoxins. But my mycolab, which is mymycolab.com, has an antibody test to mycotoxins. So if you're making a mycotoxin, an antibody to a mycotoxin, and it's an antibody called an IgE, this is an immediate sensitivity, you're exposed to that mycotoxin to an appreciable amount to, you know, tick off your immune system in the previous four weeks. So when we run those four tests, if three out of the four are positive, that person's probably in mold. And if they fill out the questionnaire and they have a, a possible or probable mold risk score, they've got to get out of mold. That's a very helpful distinguishing, you know, why are there such a myriad of tests? We had some similar questions asking really which one of these are necessary. I think that helps paint 
a better picture for what, why are they really different? What are they actually testing? They're not the same. They're not the same. And even the urine mycotoxin tests, the methods are testing apples and oranges. So, you know, in a perfect world, we would test both the ELISA method and the mass spec method, but who has the money for that? <laughs> so um, I get this question a lot. Well, well which one, because some people are running both just to see, you know, and kind of to, I'm going to test those labs. And I'm like, well, that's not an actual, I've done more split sample testing than anybody that I know. I have twins myself, identical twins. And I have a best friend with twins who was my control group. And then they got mold in their house. So I've got years and years and years through time of these identical twins. And then I did this with some of my patients. Um, because I wanted to know what are the things and the labs should be taking responsibility for this. It really makes me angry that they're not, they should be doing all this testing with large population statistics, but they're not. So um, what are the things that can mess up the lab? And that's where I found that like, oh, wow, mass spec and ELISA urine mycotoxin is testing completely different things. Not everybody is a good candidate for this. Um, and there are different ways that we can provoke, if we're testing urine, we should be provoking the kidneys, not the liver. <laughs> so, off, so I have a whole urine mycotoxin prep sheet on my website, it's free in my handouts at the footer, everyone's welcome to it. I update the diet. So if you're doing a urine mycotoxin test, make sure that you are on a low mycotoxin diet for three days before you take the test. Yes, mycotoxins you eat come out in the urine, it can happen. So let's minimize that weakness of that test by going on a low mycotoxin diet. And there's a 48 hour washout period for most mycotoxins. So if we go three days, we've probably gotten most of it out of your system from anything you ate. And then whatever you're seeing in your urine is more possible that it was actually from your, your body, <laughs> basically. Um, and I take patients off binders because we're trying to know what's the story. So for binding it, we're not gonna see it in your pee. Um, and then how do we provoke kidney clearance? It's actually with bioflavonoids. So in studies, it's been shown that bioflavonoids will help the mycotoxin come off of a blood protein that allows the kidneys to dump it. Until you do that denaturing or that pulling apart, the kidneys can't dump it because it can't lose that blood protein. It's a necessary blood protein. This is um, what is, exchanged in plasma phoresis. So if you have anyone with pandas pans, I'm like, let's let's use the bioflavonoid to dump the mycotoxins before we put you through that that um, you know huge, <laughs> scary um, procedure. And that bioflavonoid is astaxanthin or zeaxanthin. I use 12 milligrams twice a day. And I do that for, depending on the patient, anywhere from three to seven days. And then um, we might take the urine then. Some people, we just do a big bolus and then I, I collect the urine then. So it's all, all the whole provoking thing and all that, that's all religion. There's no science to back any of that up. Um, so st stay tuned, I guess, because we're learning more as we go. Yeah. That's a really helpful information as well. I've had a vein of very similar questions on that as well. Yeah. Um, I want to share one story that Elizabeth had put in our survey um, she had written, I was exposed over a lifetime of living in moldy environments, becoming disabled by my mycotoxicity at age 62. Six years of treatment later, and I'm still very limited. I don't know if my limitations are related to secondary MECFS, ongoing toxicity, or both. And I don't know what a reasonable prognosis is. Um, I have had treat some pre excuse me. I have had some treatments previously and have recently begun treatment with a local environmental medicine doctor. Um, she had a few questions related to, you know, what treatment or excuse me, what tests are really necessary of the myriad. But I want to point out one of her questions that I thought was so fruitful. It seems like you had already explained the why, but asking uh, what physician education is available for her PCP, who knows nothing about this principal health issue. Mm -hmm. I thank you. I do have a training course. It's it's geared toward medical doctors. Um, it's a 10 hour course. They can get their continuing medical education through the AMA. And so they can do their annual CE. It's online, all on their own pace. They get quizzed. Um, so if they're a primary care trained practitioner, they can then become mold literate certified. Um, and then if it if they're like, yeah, I don't know, 10, 10 hours, I don't know if I really want to di deep dive into that. 
I have a mold updates course that's going to be about a two and a two hour, maybe two and a half. We'll see how fast I can talk. Uh, course, and that's coming out this winter, and that's a good first step for a medical doctor because I will be talking about how to use prescription pads to get people better, so you can use your insurance. It's not all supplements that is necessary. We can we can use prescription omega threes. We talked about the DHA being really protective. There is a prescription, Vascax, that can be used to use your insurance to help you get better. There are probiotics we can use. There are things that can make and move bile. There are th antifungal prescriptions. So you don't have to, you know, get, break the bank on your treatment. So I, that whole course is geared toward medical doctors with prescription pads. And also this one is I've taken the different mycotoxins and done precision mycotoxin detox. So which mycotoxins are you finding? What are the things we know from animal research that are helping get that out faster? So if it, yeah, if you mentioned the 10 hour course and they're like, yeah, um, just hang on for this winter and we'll have the, the shorter two hour course, but they can get CME for it. Okay. So great. their HMO or their hospital or whatever can, can pay for it. Sure. Some motivation for them as well. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure people will be looking forward to the two hour one as well. Yeah. Um, and this is really great. Some of your answers are really covering a lot of other specific questions. I'm trying. Yeah. I read ahead. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, in terms of you've been kind of saying some of these treatment things like these systemic antifungals, things like some certain herbal supplements, um, people did have some specific questions relating to hypobaric chambers. Are there any kind of big heavy hitter treatments that come up? Um, I know you're saying some are specific to the uh, specific molds you're exposed to or specific mycotoxins you're testing positive for. But um, if there if there's anything you could say to high level treatments yeah, I would say there are four really common reasons why people aren't aren't having success with their mold, mold protocol. Um, number one is um, using binders before bioflavonoids. So if somebody's like, you have mold, put them on a binder. Well, let's think about this. Now we have two kidneys and only one liver. <laughs> and the body will prioritize getting mycotoxins out of the body through the kidneys. It's a very efficient way to get mycotoxins out. That's why we can test it in urine, right? So it's just, when we stop to think about it, it's like, okay, that kind of makes sense. And the fact that the liver, it has to go through a complex detoxification process. There's phase one, phase two, phase three. You need bile to be moving right. And mycotoxins are very, very, very good at slugging up the bile and making that process not as efficient as it could be. So if we can maximize the kidneys, kidney clearance, which is bioflavonoids, and I mentioned there, there are a bunch, but the, the ones that are specific to okra toxin are zeaxanthin and astaxanthin. If we can enhance that through bioflavonoids, now the kidneys are working at double function and you have two of them. So we have just taken your detox power and quad, quadded it, four times it or four X'd it. And then it takes the pressure off the liver as well. And you don't have to be so worried about if you don't tolerate binders, are you ever going to get better? And all these things that I hear people like, oh, no, I'm never going to get better from all because I, I can't do binders. It doesn't matter. Then use a different pathway and use the pathway where you have actually two ways to get it out instead of just one. So that's number one. Bioflavonoids before binders is my number one rule of thumb. I want to get my patient on something that's going to be pulling through the kidney clearance before we even talk about a binder. The second mistake I see is using binders when you're constipated. No, 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 no. <laughs> All that is going to do is cause more intestinal damage than had you not been taking any binders at all. And what happens is if you're taking a binder and you're constipated, that mycotoxin that was packaged up in a pillow of bile, bile is like a way that our body takes a damaging mycotoxin and puts pillows around it, little fat pillows. If you're constipated, that fat pillow will denature from the mycotoxin. And now you have this damaging mycotoxin that actually causes cell death to the lining, the, the cells that line our gut. So it, it's called apoptosis and it completely kills the cell. You want it inside that bile. So if you're constipated, don't even be thinking about binders until we can get you pooping again. And the way to do that is to move higher up the chain. So that that's more technical, but that's so our second common 
um, barrier is somebody's on binders and binders and binders and is constipated. Well, then not only are you causing intestinal damage, you're soaking that mycotoxin back up to the liver and it has to repackage. That's like the detox definition of insanity. Um, the third is forgetting the nose. So neglecting the nose. Um, I see that people don't do intranasals and those are the people that stay sick, stay reactive and can get really whacked when they get exposed to any kind of mold or mycotoxin building, even incidental exposure kind of things. Like nobody should be in a sick building. Um, everybody is affected, but it just takes some people longer to get sick. And then the fourth is antifungals. So people will wait and wait and wait. I see a lot of um, other protocols where they're like, well, we'll put you on binders and we'll wait and see how you do. That makes no sense to me. If we know from Dr. Brewer's study, which is a human study, and we know from Dr. Dennis's experience, which he has great studies as well, showing these guys make mycotoxins, not only inside of you, but they'll continue to make them even out of the body. Why would we not assist the body with antifungals? And I have a whole plan of how to do antifungals in my book. Um, I have the, I took the book snippets and put it on my Instagram. If you want to go there and check out what antifungals I'm using, I have all that information on my Instagram. You just have to page back. I think it was about six months ago we did that posting. And then I have a YouTube channel where I have tons and tons of um, videos and short tips. But those are the biggies that I would say is using binders before bioflavonoids is, is a common barrier to people not maximizing their kidney detox. Using binders when they're constipated or when I say binders when you're bound up neglecting the nose and um, forgetting the fungal overgrowth. Those are the four factors that I see get in the way all the time. Hopefully those will be really applicable to people struggling to figure out why, why this, which one is, you know, not working. And hopefully they can mm -hmm. reference those videos that you have. That's an amazing resource. Yeah. And my book goes through each step. What are the doses? You know, how do you identify the things like, is quercetin good for me or would resveratrol be better for me? And it kind of gives you what those things are good for. So if you can kind of fit it to you. I give doses, I give cautions, um, you know, if you're on certain medications or whatever and the order of operations so you can get all the way on the plan. Um, and then if you've done the full plan on your own. And I hear from families all the time. They're like, oh my gosh, we're well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We did your plan. And, you know, and for some people you need the extra help. Then we have these mold literate certified docs who can then administer any medication. If you need antifungals or, you know, different heavy hitting things, heavier hitting. <laughs> sure. But then you really laid the foundation and the framework of like, okay, now we did all this, this pre-work and then the meds work better. You don't have to be on them as long. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, I know we are just approaching the top of the hour. So I just want to ask at least one last question. Um, I know you had said that you're turning your attention lately to pans and pandas. Could you give us um, kind of a, a summary of those conditions and why, why you're turning your attention to them? Yeah. So I'm a, I'm a 24 year um, pans mom now of my twins and um, I've had my attention on it, but I'm trying to raise awareness right now about pandas and pans and how correlated they are to mold exposure um, and environmental toxin exposure. So someone had asked earlier, you know, can you get ME-CFS with no infection, just the mold? Yes, absolutely. And can you get pandas pans that way as well? Yes, it doesn't always have to be an infection that starts it. And they stand, they're, they're said together because they both are basal ganglia encephalitis conditions that look very similar clinically but they're started from different things. So in pan does, it had to have been a strep exposure and pans is the umbrella for all the other. <laughs> so pan does is sort of a subset of pans. And it basically is a pediatric condition that has some autoimmune markers where the brain is attacking itself or the immune system is attacking the brain and it causes behavior changes. So anxiety, a lot of anxiety and mold causes a lot of anxiety. So that's an interesting crossover. Um, separation anxiety, anticipatory anxiety, that kind of thing, OCD, tics, behavioral regression, um, irritability, aggression, and some sleep issues, tummy, tummy pain issues and urinary frequency. And in some kids, some food restriction. 
So those are the kind of, there's a, there are clinical criteria for those as well. So I'm just trying to raise awareness about that because I, you know, in, I, I wrote my mold book just because we had mold in my house and I knew exactly what to do. And I was like, everybody should know this because it's in, it's within everyone's hands. You know, um, a lot of people can get better without any kind of pharmaceutical at all. And I wanted everyone to know that I just felt duty bound to write the book and since doing that. Then I was, and I figured it'd be like just a few people. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, this mold thing is huge. Um, so then it, it went into the pandas pans world because then a lot of people were like, I, I think my kids might have that pans thing after, after our moldy building. And I was like, oh yeah, they're super correlated. Um, so now that's my goal is I, I hope to raise awareness on things where it's mold created X condition. And if, if there's anything of that condition that needs to be treated differently than the way we would just treat mold. Like I get a lot of questions from people at the MECFS that are like, well, how would you change your protocol for MECFS? And the answer is I wouldn't. When we treat the mold, if that was the thing that induced your condition, Treating the mold treats the condition. Yeah, that's like the big mic drop moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's hard not to have a better summary than that. Um, but that's amazing that you're turning some of your your personal experience with it, like you said, with your clinical and all this mountain of knowledge you have from your your clinical practice and educating physicians now as well. Yeah. I mean, people are suffering. It just breaks my heart. You know, they've been, I saw Eric is on here just like, you know, years and years and he's like the, the OG of like this, this horrible experience. And that's not, that's not the OG anybody wants to be, you know, you want to be the OG of healing. <laughs> yeah. Being healed. Yeah. Well, since we're just, uh, just over five o'clock, I want to thank you, Dr. Jill, for answering all these questions. We had so many that we couldn't fit in, but I'm really hopeful that your verbose answers really touched on a lot of specific things that people wanted to know about. So I'm hoping that we really covered at least everything that we could. We could have you here for hours. So we really appreciate your time and sharing your wisdom with us. It's been an absolute honor. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Jill. Um, so we want to just have a few closing words um, for the um, next events for Sunday Conversations. So for the month of September, this was our program, but we do not have a Sunday conversation in October. Um, we will hope that you'll attend the annual meeting on October 26th, and you can see the newsletter for details on that. Um, our next Sunday conversation will instead be in November on the 17th, the third Sunday of the month at 4 p.m. Eastern Time. And Mass ME member Ruth Axelrod will discuss um, doctors are human beings too, something that we probably all need to remember. And there'll be more details regarding this program closer to that event. Uh, finally, if you have found this program worthwhile, there are a few ways you can help. You can make a donation to help support this series by donating online at this website, massmecfs.org slash donate. And on the same page, you can sign up for the MassME newsletter. And along with your donation of $25 or more, you can check the, or if you check the option for become a member, that will establish or renew your membership, and you'll be invited to our members-only programs. So I want to thank you all for coming, and thank you again to Dr. Jill for your insightful answers to these questions, and thank you everyone for submitting uh, questions to our survey as well, and we hope to see you all at the annual meeting on October 26th. Thank you.